Salam sejahtera and Salam Satu Malaysia. At the outset, allow me to convey my, my appreciation uh, to Prof. Sharifah for her invitation here this morning. Also to Yayasan Saim Dhabi for the generous support of this program. It is very uh, humbling to be invited here to open this session of talks. Uh, of course, the goal, the objective of this series is to strengthen ties between the university, within the university and between the university and other relevant agencies and organizations. Well, I'll talk a, a bit about uh, the background to the ADP. I, I have to begin with some qualifiers first, and I'll get through that very quickly. But uh, in terms of the politics of climate change, the stakeholders are very important. The outcome of the most recent uh, negotiations in Warsaw are very important. There are two work streams, work stream one and work stream two. Then we need to understand uh, why the group of 77 is important, what are its strengths, what are its vulnerabilities, and how Malaysia plays its role within the group of 77 in China as well as the other uh, coalitions within the, uh, the uh, UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. We look at some key concerns as we move forward to the 2015 agreement, and then uh, we'll have a bit of a discussion on what the dilemma is for developing countries in terms of the kind of outcome, the legal instrument, the protocol, or the uh, legal outcome with, with uh, the, or the agreed outcome with legal force that might come about as a result of these negotiations. Before I move to the way forward, I'd actually like to open up the floor a little bit to uh, talk about a bit about the Inter Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, and how politics is moving even into intergovernmental bodies that are supposed to be primarily technological or technical or scientific in nature. This is very important, and there are many ways to pervert the science uh, to your own purposes if you uh, have a, a very loose understanding of the ethics of some of these issues. But let me begin by talking a little bit about uh, the background of the, the Framework Convention. Of course, the, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change is one of the three multilateral environmental agreements, or MEAs, to come out from the original Rio Earth Summit process, the other two being the Convention on Biological Diversity, as well as the Convention for Preve Prevention of Desertification. Okay. And uh, because of that, it inherits the key principles from the Rio Earth Summit. Some of these principles are that it should be science-based, the precautionary principle should be applied, the polluter pays principle, uh, the principle of equity, and of course common but differentiated responsibilities, which is uh, abbreviated CBDR. Okay. So because of its pedigree and because of the history that it draws from the Rio Earth Summit, the Rio Plus 20 talks set a very important precedent in, first of all, involving uh, the participation of heads of states, and then in terms of its outcome, in reaffirming the original Rio uh, principles, all right? So whenever heads of delegations come to us and say, well, ministers decided in Warsaw, or ministers decided in Doha, such and such, well, we have to respond to them, well, yes, they did so, but that decision should be understood in the context of the Rio Plus 20 affirmations which were decided by heads of states. So, yes, uh, the politics of climate change is somewhat about pulling rank. It is somewhat about what your heads of states have decided they're going to do, as opposed to what your minister perhaps has decided that the country is going to do. So, because of this, it is very important that, that all these multilateral environmental agreements remain fresh in our minds, because they should reinforce each other. Uh, politically, scientifically, as well as, as uh, in terms of, of their implementation by countries. Okay? The UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, since its inception, can roughly be divided into three uh, stages, I suppose, or phases. In the first phase, what we see is that the convention was used primarily by developing countries to forward the idea that while 
Adaptation is important. We really have to focus on mitigation because mitigation is what's going to reduce the need to adapt to extreme weather events in the future. And so, uh, with the convention being around 22 years now, there should have been ample time to implement all the pillars of the convention. So we're talking about mitigation, adaptation, finance, technology transfer as the main four. But during this first phase, leading up to the first commitment period and through the first commitment period of the Kyoto Protocol, we see that the primary impetus has been to drive mitigation. The only real uh, mechanism that has come about has been the Kyoto Protocol as, an, as a legally binding instrument. And this has been with the sole purpose of getting developed countries and developing countries to think about and actually reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. Now, people look at the Kyoto Protocol. As a matter of fact, you will hear developed countries say, well, the Kyoto Protocol was not an ideal <coughs> instrument because it only had economy-wide legally binding emissions reductions targets for developed countries, whereas developing countries were able to get off scot-free. Now, that is not the case. Malaysia is both a signatory and has ratified the Kyoto Protocol as well. And the context of emissions reductions commitments for developing countries actually lies in the clean development mechanism. When you undertake an agreement with a developed country to sell them emissions reductions credits, you in fact commit yourself to reducing emissions. And when we hear developed countries uh, being very rough on countries like China and India, we have to remind them that part of the reason, for example, the EU, part of the reason why the EU was able to uh, achieve its emissions reductions cuts was because of the emissions reductions credits generated by countries like China and India and South Korea and others, including Malaysia. Okay, so in this phase, we were supposed to focus on all the four areas, but we only got mitigation, and that's why mitigation is bolded there. In terms of finance, we wanted a, a financial mechanism under the convention, but what we got instead was the GEF standing in, or the, the Global Environment Facility, under the World Bank standing in as a temporary um, entity under the, the, the uh, te temporary um, financial entity uh, to serve the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. So it's only very recently, in the last year or so, that we've finally gotten the Green Climate Fund, which is under the COP, under the Conference of Parties. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later, okay? So when we, when we look at the situation in retrospect, what we see is that this mitigation phase was the first phase of, or the first set of goalpost relocations, shifting of the goalposts. So finance went to the, the Global Environment Facility. Adaptation was funded through the Adaptation Fund, which got its funds from CDM projects which are actually funds that were supposed to go to developing countries. So the developed countries actually got developing countries to fund their own adaptation, rather than adaptation being, as it's supposed to be, one of the pillars under the convention. And finally, the US signs, but doesn't ratify the Kyoto Protocol. So one of the strongest negotiators, one of the strongest proponents in the Kyoto Protocol negotiations for weakening the Kyoto Protocol, ultimately, was not bound by it. Okay, So, here we have a problem. We've got a, a, a legally binding instrument that doesn't include the US. So we go to phase two. And the phase two is, is what I call the LCA phase, the long-term cooperative action phase, where we decide we want to bring the US back in because they have sat out of the first uh, commitment period of the Kyoto Protocol. We want to bring them in by the beginning of the second commitment period. And they've already said, well, we won't come in under the protocol. So we said, well, we create a space for you under the convention, so you can come in under the convention. So in the LCA phase, what, we, what, what this began with was actually um, a, a pledge by the US, sort of, that we'll, we'll talk about coming in if developing countries 
will begin a dialogue on long-term cooperative action to enhance the implementation of the convention. And so we thought, well, what's the harm in that? We can have a, a dialogue. But even then, we were extremely uh, cautious about this. And this is a Greek text, by the way. We put this clause in. Further resolves that the dialogue will take the form of an open and non-binding exchange of views, information, and ideas in support of enhanced implementation of the convention and will not open any negotiations leading to new commitments for developing countries. So as a caveat, we put that, that statement in and it was agreed by all parties. But how soon we forget that this ever existed because we take other decisions that supersede these decisions. All right. So developing countries actually have, since this Montreal COP, which was in 2011, made major, major concessions. And now we have uh, a situation where we are undertaking nationally appropriate mitigation actions. Some of the developing countries have made uh, pledges for the Copenhagen Accord. We are now required to do biennial update reports, which is to produce uh, mitigation reports every two years, as well as updates of our uh, national greenhouse gas inventory. And these uh, biennial update reports will now be subject to international consultation and analysis, which if you look at the actual decision, is actually an exercise in transparency. But as you will see, there is talk about, once again, anchoring these biennial update reports to the upcoming pledges in the 2015 agreement. Okay. So, in the meantime, at the end of the LCA talks, uh, which ended in, in uh, Durban in South Africa, the US still has no mitigation commitments. Okay. So the US is now sitting out effectively of two sets of, of uh, time periods for which other countries have legally binding emissions reductions targets. All right. So if that weren't bad enough, the US is being a shining example to some other countries who have either left the protocol altogether, as in the case of Canada, or as in the case of Japan, Russia, and New Zealand, are staying in the Kyoto Protocol, but not taking emissions reductions targets for the second commitment period. So we question, you know, what, what's, what's the point of, of remaining in, in the Kyoto Protocol when you don't have a target? And the answer is quite simple. If you are still in the protocol, you can still avail yourself to the CDM mechanism. And you can still use emissions reductions offsets uh, to achieve your now non-binding targets. Okay? So here we are now after two phases where the US has actually set out. And before we move into the third phase, I'd like to step back a little bit and look at, take, take, take stock a little bit and look at what it is that we actually agreed in the convention itself, the parent document. Okay. The first four articles of the convention are of paramount importance. They're very clear. They are, were negotiated for a long period of time. The approach taken was very cautious and very meticulous. Article 1 is simply definitions. Article 2 are the objectives of the convention. And the objectives of the convention really have nothing to do with emissions reductions targets per se. The objective of the convention is to stabilize atmospheric concentrations of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere to allow ecosystems time, and I'm paraphrasing, to allow ecosystems time to adapt and to ensure that important services like food security remain uh, uninterrupted. All right. So that's the primary objective of the convention. And then, of course, the principles we drew from the Rio principles. And then finally, Article 4 is commitments. Now, Article 4.1 is everybody's commitment. Everybody has a commitment to report. Everybody has a commitment to implement measures. But when we get to Article 4.2, then we begin uh, focusing on the specific commitments of developed countries as opposed to developing countries. Now, I use developed countries in a very loose way because specifically, what we're talking about are Annex 1 countries, a list of countries included in an Annex to the Convention, uh, 
which have a responsibility to account for historical emissions. So what we're talking about are countries that for the most part began their industrial uh, revolution in the mid-1800s uh, and have since then managed to reap the benefits of having an industrialized economy very early in the game. All right, And because of the lag time between uh, the moment in which emissions occur and in which uh, extreme weather events as a result of those emissions occur, what we are finding now is that what we are experiencing now in terms of emission or extreme weather events is actually the result of the cumulative uh, uh, atmospheric greenhouse gas emissions. Now, it is true that developing countries are among the highest emitters at this point in time. And if nothing is done about that, that it will seriously affect climate systems. But if you look at the last 22 years, we'll see that the developed countries have had ample time to implement the pillars of the convention relating to finance and technology transfer, which would have resulted in a very different present than the present from the present that we have now. Okay? So we've had 22 years without the US commitments. We've had finance for reporting, but not for specifically for adaptation or mitigation. And we've had 22 years without relevant technology transfer that we need. Okay? So, a little thought experiment. You often hear now in the negotiations, uh, primarily the EU, saying things like, well, if we don't do anything about developing country emissions now, by 2030, they will account for oh, some 30% of global emissions. And by 2050, they will account for 70% of global emissions and so forth. Okay? And this may be true based on their projections, based on their simulations. But the question that I have for the EU negotiators is, are you saying that this, these are the levels of emissions that will occur with developed countries meeting their commitments to provide finance and technology transfer or without the commitment of developed countries to provide finance and technology transfer? And of course, the answer to that question, which they will not answer, is without. All right? So not only have they abdicated on the responsibility to provide finance and technology transfer for the last 22 years, it is their fervent hope to escape from that responsibility in the future as well. Of course, they will not say it. Okay. Now, in the last phase, or the most recent phase, uh, compared with the previous phase, we wanted to bring the US in and couldn't. So now the solution is to bring everyone in. And for that we have, uh, thanks to the, the uh, negotiation in Durban, the ADP, or the Ad Hoc Working Group on the Durban Platform for Enhanced Action. Okay? And this essentially replaces the long-term cooperative action as the complement to the second commitment period. So the second commitment period is ongoing now. Uh, it will go until 2020, at which point the new agreement, the so-called ADP, will take force. Now, because the ADP is supposed to take force in 2020, we want to complete negotiations on the ADP by 2015, which is very soon. Okay? So, the ADP, as, as you can see, is divided into two work streams. The first work stream actually deals with the post-2020 period. That is the agreement that Malaysia is primarily concerned about because it will be a legally binding agreement, it will be a ratifiable agreement. Okay? But the Kyoto Protocol will actually move in parallel prior to 2020 with what is called Work Stream 2, in which countries that are not under the Kyoto Protocol will actually be required to raise their ambition outside of the Kyoto Protocol between now and 2020. All right. So, um, I said I had some, some uh, caveats that I wanted to talk about at the beginning of this talk, and, and I seem to have missed them already, but it's never too late to, to go into them now. The, the first qualification that I'd like to make about this talk is that I will be focusing primarily on the ad hoc working group on the urban platform from now onwards. All right, there are many other 
uh, activities ongoing under the, the UNFCCC, uh, in particular under the subsidiary bodies. We have uh, two permanent subsidiary bodies. One is the subsidiary body for implementation, which uh, sees to the implementation of the convention. We also have a subsidiary body for scientific and technological advice called the SUBSTA. And that is supposed to be a non-political body that uh, refers uh, that, that uh, actually refers to the COP for its, for its uh, program of work and takes on itself uh, scientific and technological uh, decisions for which it provides advice to the COP. Now that is related to a third body which is even further out called the Intergovernmental on, on Panel on Climate Change or the IPCC, uh, of which uh, we have some Malaysian scientists uh, who are uh, authors, coordinating authors, lead authors, etc. All right, but that's supposed to be a completely scientific body. The other uh, qualification that I'd like to, to make at this point is that my view of this is the Malaysians, Malaysian government's view of this. And so it is a biased view, but it is biased in favor of developing countries and the dilemmas that they find themselves in, having to, first of all, uh, deal with sustainable development and poverty eradication, and then thereafter to deal with extreme weather events that are the result not of our current emissions, but of cumulative historical emissions. So um, I do know the position of, of our the, the developed country parties, and I will talk about those positions. But I will also explain to you why those positions are not tenable under the convention. Right. Okay. So the objective of the ad hoc working group is uh, under the Devon platform, this is a temporary uh, ad hoc working group, is a protocol, another legal instrument, or an agreed outcome with legal force. This is extremely vague language, it's purposefully vague, um, and it was agreed in, in Durban in the closing hours of extra time or injury time. The work under the ADP has been, ex has, has been conducted in an exchange of views mode where countries tell each other what they believe the ADP ought to be. But in the recent meetings, it has taken on a more focused mode. As a matter of fact, in um, the most recent meetings in uh, Bonn, just a week ago, we agreed to finally form the first contact group for the ADP. Okay? So in this contact group, we hope to look at the individual submissions of parties, the statements made by parties, and begin putting some text down on paper because we do need elements for a draft negotiating text by the time we get to the 20th COP in Lima, Peru at the end of this year. Now, I'd like to also look at, at the Atto Working Group and the Durban Platform as a, a filter for core values of individual states, individual parties and, and party groupings. Okay. And I'd like to extend it beyond party groupings because the COP is also open, the UNFCCC is also open to observer organizations. And the first group of, organize, uh, of, of uh, observer organizations are the IGOs, inter intergovernmental uh, organizations, of which you will find, as I mentioned, the, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, groups like the World uh, Meteorological Organization, the World Health Organization, and others. So these stakeholders have a keen interest in uh, the work of the, the, the UNFCCC and the decisions uh, that come out of this. The second group, uh, sometimes uh, more vocal, more strident, are the NGOs. Of course, uh, uh, WWF is in there, the, the, the Climate Action Network, Greenpeace, Oxfam, and our own uh, NGOs, including the Third World Network, including South Centre and others. And these NGOs, apart from being uh, what is traditionally their role, the conscience of the, the Framework Convention, they are actually now uh, providing valuable service to parties in terms of analysis. And particularly groups like Third World Network and South Centre do very valuable analysis of statements made by parties, of submissions by parties, to give us a, a true sense of where parties are coming from. Okay, we get to the first group of, of uh, parties. This is the umbrella group. This is a, a group of developed country parties. Uh, US, Canada, Japan, Russia, Norway, Australia, New Zealand. Uh, 
A second group of, of uh, developed country parties is the Environmental Integrity Group. Uh, this group is, is Switzerland, Mexico, South Korea, Liechtenstein, and Monaco. Now, this group focuses more on OECD countries, right? But all in all, these two groups uh, are primarily developed countries. We have the largest group of developing countries, the default group, if you don't belong anywhere else, the group of 77 in China. And this is a group that is, is quite dear to me because I happen to be the G77 and China coordinator for ADP, which means that I have the impossible task of trying to bring 120 or so countries to agree on an opening statement, a stock-taking statement, and a closing statement, as well as, as a group position. And it's almost impossible to, to have a group position for this number of countries. Within the group of 77 and China, we have several very important subgroups. The first is the, the basic group, which is India, China, South Africa, and uh, what am I missing? Mex uh, Brazil. Brazil. All right, this is, this is a very influential group because of the size of their economies, right? Then we have the vulnerable groups. The Association of Small Island States, the Least Developed Countries, the African Group, the Landlocked and Mountainous Countries Group, so you'll find in this group Nepal and, and others. Some of them are least developed countries as well. So there's a lot of, of uh, crossover in, in this group. And this is a group that, that G77 in China has to listen to very closely. Because this group is the group of countries that is most greatly impacted by climate change and climate change events. The uh, countries in, in the Pacific and the Caribbean islands that are atoll based are already having their feet washed every time there are king tides. All right, some of them have already been given uh, asylum in, in other developing countries because of, of rising sea levels and because of erosion. Uh, and saltwater intrusion into their, their cropping areas. So as, as G77 and China, we, we do pay a lot of attention to, to the group of, of, of uh, this group of countries. Now, we have uh, some geographic groups, Latin American countries, ALBA and ILAC. And the most recent group is a group that's not geographic in nature, that is not economic uh, in nature, but a somewhat ragtag group of developing countries numbering around 30 that have as their membership members of various other groups. For example, in the like-minded group or LMDC, we have India and China, which are part of BASIC. We have Nicaragua, El Salvador, Venezuela, Bolivia, which are part of ALBA. We have the Philippines and Malaysia, who do not belong to any other group because ASEAN does not is not a group that is recognized under the UNFCCC. And if you think about it, ASEAN is as diverse as the group of 77 and China, having the proto-OECD Singapore, as well as the least uh, LDC uh, member uh, in Myanmar. So uh, the only grouping for countries like Malaysia essentially is a group like the like-minded developing countries if we, if we do not have a G77 and China position, which tends to happen fairly frequently, okay? So, under Workstream 1, which I will focus on uh, uh, more because it's the long-term agreement that's going to be agreed in 2015 and uh, come into force in 2020, we now have a contact group. This was very hard for because developed countries did not want to have a contact group. They wanted the uh, negotiations to proceed on a more informal note, exchange of ideas, round tables, open-ended consultations and in the end, hope that the co-chairs would toss us an agreement based on what they heard parties say that we would have to either take it or leave. All right. So developed countries uh, didn't mind this because they tend to usually come out uh, on top. But developing countries, in particular the group of 77 and China, managed to find common ground to agree that no, the process will take into account the views of parties and the output will reflect the text that parties eventually agree on. So we're taking it back from the co-chairs, okay? So we are now working on elements of a draft negotiating text. We will need this text by Lima. This will be an agreement that is applicable to all parties 
will be under the convention, guided by the objectives and principles of the convention, although later on you'll see that this means a lot of things depending on who you speak to. What we will have to do, though, as part of this new phase, is we will have to articulate nationally determined contributions. This is something new. Now, and this, and this came out of, of negotiations during the last COP in Warsaw, where we were finally beginning to focus on what kind of commitments parties would have to take under the new agreement. And of course, when we're talking about commitments, we go back to the parent document, which is the convention, specifically Article 3. All right? And developing countries actually put forward the text that we were willing to take commitments in the context of Article 3, which the US immediately objected to. And that's why we now have the ambiguous language nationally determined contributions. So the next question that comes up is, of course, what is, what are part of these contributions? So immediately developed countries say, well, these co it's obvious, these contributions have to be uh, mitigation. They have to be emissions reductions cuts, okay? And not only do we have to make uh, decisions on what these, these nationally determined contributions are, we need to, to understand how they will be presented, how they will be received, how they will be considered, how they will be captured and documented. So all these things are now part of the negotiations. Which parts have to be legally binding? How do they have to be binding? Will there be any aggregation uh, between, between parties? How will we make sure that, that this uh, is something that can grow ambition? And how will we incorporate uh, uh, principles like fairness, equity, and what is determined by science? Also, because this is a long-term agreement, how do we build in flexibility? How do we build in durability? What frameworks, mechanisms, or processes are needed? What is the role of cooperative action? Okay. What is the role of markets or non-market mechanisms? And how will the 2015 agreement facilitate, catalyze, enable, and support transition to a low emission, climate resilient development path? Now, this language may sound very innocuous, but this is the language that comes to us from the co-chairs notes, informal notes, which are a document without any standing, but nevertheless a document that can serve to guide the discussions. Now the reason why I, I raise some of these things is because I want us to compare the language in the chair's notes with the language of the convention. The language of the convention is stabilization of greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere at a level that will prevent dangerous anthropogenic interference with climate systems. And now compare it with the very lame and very weak language the 2015 agreement is a framework to facilitate, to catalyze, to enable and support transition. Okay, so how far we have come from a document, a convention designed to actually help us gain control, regain control of the Earth's atmospheric systems and instead turn it into uh, an instrument that is supposed to help us, if we so choose, to, to fix the, the problem that we've created. Okay? So all the talk now is about integrating climate change into economic, into economic development. And this tie is a tie to the SDGs, which is another attempt at forum shopping. I'll talk about forum shopping uh, shortly. Okay? And finally, what I talked about earlier, the possibility of anchoring biennial update reports, which are about transparency, into the 2015 agreement, which is about commitments and possibly compliance. Okay? So, as I said, I'm going to be biased about this. All right. And compliance, that's at the bottom. Okay. So, I won't spend time on, on the work, work stream 2 outcome because this is on pre-20... Uh, 20 ambition. Suffice to say that this is something that, that we are helping our AOSIS friends on, our small island uh, uh, developing states friends on, because they have actually put in a work plan and we'd like to support that work plan to increase ambition in the pre-2020 period.
Okay? But what of these nationally determined contributions? Well, they have to be in by the first quarter of 2015. The US impression of the scope of this is that's only mitigation. And not only is it mitigation, it is unconditional mitigation at that. Which means mitigation that is not dependent on receiving finance and technology transfer from developed countries. Okay? So, as another thought experiment, um, I'd like to first, us, for, for us, first of all, to think about uh, what should be in these nationally determined contributions. And of course, the developing countries have said it's much broader than just mitigation. It has to include adaptation because mitigation measures have to be protected by adaptation measures. It is fruitless to clear forests, to build hydroelectric dams, to generate renewable electricity, if after you've built these dams, you get hit by a drought, which means that you have neither water to drink, nor electricity, nor forests. And by then, the industries that you've set up to receive the electricity from these hydroelectric dams are going to place demands on your country to instead build coal-fired power plants to supply electricity to these industries. So what started out as a mitigation activity to shift to renewable uh, electricity has actually resulted in the clearing of forests, the production of concrete for dams, and the purchase and, and, and uh, uh, commissioning of fossil fuel power plants. In the same way that there's maladaptation, there's also malmitigation. Okay. So when we look at adaptation in this way, the first thing to understand is that this is not an option for developed countries, uh, sorry, for developing countries. First of all, we are having to adapt to extreme weather, to, to handle extreme weather events that are not of our doing. Because it's historic emissions that are causing these events to occur now. If I didn't have to spend money on ramping up uh, or upgrading our flood mitigation projects, I could spend that money on sustainable development. I could spend it on poverty eradication. I could spend it on mitigation. You see? So the developed countries somewhat begrudgingly said, okay, 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 so, so, so we see that, that, that uh, you do not have an option. Okay, this is something that, that, you, that is obligatory for you. You have to protect your populations. You have to protect your industries. But when it comes to adaptation, it still shouldn't be part of your nationally determined contributions because the benefits of adaptation are local. Whereas the benefits of mitigation are global. If I reduce emissions, the entire globe benefits. But if I adapt, only my country benefits. And at the last meetings, I said no. I said when Thailand takes adaptation measures to protect its rice crops, it ensures food security not just for Thailand, but for much of South and Southeast Asia. When Malaysia takes adaptation measures to protect its oil palm crop, it ensures oil supplies for much of the world. Edible oil supplies. Okay, and so you cannot say that the benefits of adaptation, even the adaptation measures funded by ourselves, only have a national impact. Okay? So, we're going to take, of course, this argument further, and after I said that, the, the US didn't really come back to me on it, so we'll see how that works. <laughs> okay, so where are we in terms of agreement in the group of 77 and China? I'll tell you, truthfully, getting agreement in the group of 77 and China is like pulling teeth, okay? But we do have six core areas where we, we have strong agreement, all right? Uh, we must not uh, reinterpret or rewrite the convention. Uh, the process must be party-driven, it must be inclusive, must be transparent. It should lead to a balanced and ambitious outcome. And we should actually have a balanced approach as we move forward, not just between World Stream 1 and World Stream 2, uh, pre and post 2020, but also in World Stream 1, we need all the elements to move forward together. And the six elements that have been, been identified are mitigation, adaptation, finance, technology transfer, capacity building, and the last one being transparency of actions and support. Okay. In addition, 
The Group of 77 in China is extremely uh, strong in, the, uh, in agreement on the importance of finance and on the need to adapt. And the roles of the various parties in providing uh, input and output. Okay, so we are very clear on these things. We still have a lot of problems, uh, areas where, where we differ significantly, but for the most part, we, we were able to, to put forward a fairly strong closing argument just a week ago. Okay? The other issue that, that uh, you might uh, imagine is a problem is coordinating uh, such a big group. If you look at the other groups, the OECD groups, they meet outside of the UNFCC and other areas. The G20 meet, okay, the G8 meet relatively often, all right? But develop, developing country parties do not have a lot of time to coordinate with each other. The only time they can really meet is the G77 meetings in New York, all right? So, as I, as I said earlier, we do not want to give the co-chairs too much leeway, too much latitude. We will take that role ourselves. The U.S. Uh, sorry, the, the, the co-chairs tend to be a, a, a filter for text submissions. In fact, the co-chairs were brazen enough to ask us in the last session if we trust the co-chairs. This, of course, was the developing country co-chair from the Trinidad and Tobago, whom I will not name. But I will tell you that the selection of co-chairs for the entire ADP period was ex extremely contentious and involved a great deal of of um, uh, negotiating and uh, um, bargaining by even among even among developing countries, and the only solution was to choose all the co-chairs for the entire period from both the developed and developing countries and agree on when they would would have their tenure as co-chairs. So, in the first session, we actually had uh, uh, Mr. Mauskar from India, and we had uh, Ambassador Dovlin from Norway. And Mr. Mauska was, was an extremely cooperative and friendly co-chair to us, developing countries. Now we have uh, a co-chair from the EU um, and one from the Trinidad and Tobago. And the G77 is having some trouble with these co-chairs. We are also having trouble with some of the processes that give us these, these decisions. Uh, and I refer to what is called the horrendous huddle. At the close of negotiations, if there are still areas where there are impasses, what the co-chairs will do is ask the parties to solve the problem. And parties will huddle in a group in the corner of the room, at the front of the room, at the back of the room. And in this group, which is neither transparent nor inclusive, okay, they will come up with text. And this text is presented as take it or leave it text to the broader group. So the group of 77 in China doesn't like this. And the like-minded group on, on, clim uh, on climate change likes it far less. So we intend to say no more playing with text in the end game. Okay? If we cannot achieve an agreement, call a recess. Like-minded group will sit down together and we will bring you our textual proposals. And this is going to, I think, have a large... Uh, degree of pushback from the developed countries who actually benefit from stronger presence in these huddles. These huddles also tend to occur in injury time. Number one, after your minister has left and you may or may not have a mandate to speak on his behalf. Two, when everyone is dead tired after two weeks of, of negotiations and you must know that developed country delegations are far larger than ours and are very well supported by teams of lawyers and diplomats. Okay, and, and three, uh, you know, at, at a time when, when uh, essentially uh, all your, your, your tempers are, are worn extremely thin. All right. So if we allow this to continue, then we will continue to lose in negotiations. So we have a contact group which is, is an, in an, an improvement. We want to make sure that there's balanced progress. And we want to make sure that we're not misrepresented in the press by developed countries. Uh, in fact, in Warsaw, a number of times, uh, the EU climate envoy actually went to the press. And we were immediately able to mobilize uh, 
uh, a counter spokesperson on the side of the LNDC to go and speak to the press. This negotiation is done as much among NGOs and in the press as it is in the negotiating halls. Okay? So, no last minute decisions. Take a positive tone and make sure that the strategies and outcome scenarios are ones that we are controlling. Okay? Now, these are the problems. We are in a dilemma now. How do we have an agreement that the US can live with, but at the same time, that the small island developing states need simply to live? All right? And, and I'll be very frank with you and tell you that the only way to meet a two degree outcome is to leave the US behind again. Because if everyone takes the level of ambition that the U.S. currently has, it will result in a race to the bottom, and it will result in, in even more extreme weather events. It will result in a four to six degree uh, world. Okay, and these are average temperature increases globally, not specific location temperature increases, which, much, which might be less, or in all probability might be much greater. Okay, so let's bring this down to the Malaysian scenario then. What should Malaysia put forward as its intended, uh, does it, uh, as its intended uh, national contributions, nationally determined contributions? Well, this is the, the question that I actually put to the UK climate envoy, uh, Sir David King, when he visited my minister recently. I said to him, Malaysia now has a conditional voluntary indicator to reduce the the emissions intensity of, of GDP by up to 40%. And it's conditional because it relies on finance and technology transfer, which we have not yet received, by the way. Okay? And right now we are maybe 25, 30% out of the 40% on our own funding. Okay? But how do we know where we will end? How do we know, will we know what we achieve in 2020? if we don't know how much finance and technology transfer we're going to receive? And how can we put up a nationally determined contribution for the post-2020 period when we don't know where we're going to begin? Because where we end in 2020 is where we begin for the post-2020 period, and the emissions reductions that we might be able to accomplish then depend on which part of the marginal abatement cost curve we are at at that point in time and the relative cost per tonne of emissions reductions. And when I put this question to Sir David King, he looked at me straight in the eye and said, I know exactly what you're talking about. And then he changed the subject. So developed countries do not always necessarily have the solutions to this problem either. But in the last decision set in Warsaw, in fact, decision 3 CP19, okay, in Warsaw, on long-term finance, we have agreed that clarity of support in terms of finance and technology transfer will be essential for developing countries to begin putting forward their nationally determined contributions. Clarity in finance and technology transfer from developed country parties. So that is a decision that we will be quoting fairly often. All right? Okay. Now, I do want to talk about the fifth assessment report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. The IPCC, as you know, is supposed to be uh, a, a scientific organization, all right? But what we are finding is that this process, which is supposed to be driven by the science, is also being perverted. Because we now have, uh, un under the fifth assessment report, we have three working groups. The first working group deals with the science of climate change, the second with adaptation, and the third with mitigation. And the third it, report is now under review by parties. And what we are finding out is that the underlying document is actually being subverted in the process of producing what is called the, the SPM, or the Summary for Policymakers. And don't get us wrong, 
developing countries are the ones that requested the summary for policymakers because we believe that our decision makers need everyday language from which to work. We are the ones that, that requested the summary for policymakers. But the way in which the summary is being produced has been fraught with what at, at the very least would be incompetencies, at the very worst would be unethical. Okay? So, what we are finding out is if you cannot win at the negotiations, find somewhere else you can win. And that is skewing the science of climate change. So, what do you do? You present discrete studies as comprehensive research. Okay? Or you overestimate potential for mitigation in developing countries and you underestimate the cost. Or you ignore or you prohibit data when you disagree with the findings. You use baselines or reference levels that suit your purpose. One of these is, is to move the reference year for the beginning of the accounting of emissions uh, more, recent, more recently so that it is the bulk of developing country parties that, that are contributing to emissions. Okay? And finally, you paint scenarios with supporting assumptions, but you are very selective about the assumptions and therefore selective about the scenarios. Let me give you one example. There's a table now proposed in the, in the um, summary for policymakers that talks about what happens if developed country parties peak their emissions in 2020. Now bear in mind that under the Kyoto Protocol, the reference year for uh, emissions reductions for developed countries is 1990, which means that they were supposed to have peaked in 2000, which means that cumulative emissions from then till now would have been much lower, Okay, allowing developing countries more room for sustainable development and later peaking dates. But there is a table in the SPM now where developed, developed countries peak in 2020, which means then that that's the average. Because countries like, like the UK and Germany have already peaked, right? If now the bulk of developed countries peaks in 2020, that means that other developed countries will continue to go on emitting high levels beyond 2020, all right? And of course, if you accept this scenario, and you accept a scenario where you are going to hold the increase in, in global average temperatures to 2 degrees, and you have a target that has to be achieved by 2030, that developing country parties will have to do a lot more. It's inevitable. Okay? So this table shows that if developed countries speak in 2020, when the major groups of developing countries will have to peak. And sure enough, they have to peak in 2025, 27, 2030, which will be extremely costly for our economies because we cannot transition in that amount of time, especially without finance and technology transfer from developed countries. Okay? Presenting the subjective as the objective. Okay? Who should do what mitigation? It's a judgment call. It is not a scientific determination. All right? Because we are now roped in by the fact that we've been overtaken by events and developed countries have done nothing to either reduce their own emissions or to provide finance and technology in the last 22 years. And quite sadly, the indication is that they will not do so uh, either in the time between now and 2015, because they want to see what pledges are going to come in from developing country parties, or even in the post-2015 period. All right? And this, even as Malaysia is preparing in our RMK 11, the period from 2016 to 2020, to actually get the country ready for emissions reductions targets by 2020. All right? So, we have our due diligence, we have uh, our information programs, PR and outreach for the press. We need to control the mode of work uh, 
make sure that the tone is always positive. Okay, we have to address developments in other forums. Okay, the Sustainable Development Forum, things like the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Okay, the World Meteorological Organizations forums and all these other things, and more importantly, we are now we are now having we are, we are now we are now in a situation where the climate debt from developed to developing countries is increasing because we are paying for more and more of the measures taken to address climate change. Okay, the market mechanisms have all but failed. The CVM price is in the gutter because there's no control over demand and supply. And developed countries persist in calling for a new market mechanism because they refuse to ramp up emissions reductions domestically. Okay. Thank you very much.